A very, very good afternoon to those joining us this afternoon for our masterclass on Ashoka or Ahsoka um, in the Buddhism HSC course. My name is Anthony Nadira. I'm the assistant principal at Patrician Brothers College, Fairfield. Okay. So as our course, um, just to start off with, we'll have a look at what the syllabus is actually asking us to do. Uh, what we're looking at is to explain the contribution to the development and expression of Buddhism of Ashoka or Ashoka, depending on how you spell it, doesn't really matter. Ashoka was a mysterious and a legendary um, king of the Marian dynasty. Um, and the contributions that I will be going through with you today regarding to the expression and development of Buddhism, they may be different to your teacher or what your teacher has said, and that's all acceptable, then that's okay as well. Um, today's format is fairly a, a, is a lecture, but there's room for questions and answers at the end. So feel free to pop your questions into the chat if you like as well. Okay, the second thing that we're asked to do is then to analyze the impact of those contributions. It's good to have an idea of the end in mind. How is this unit assessed or how is this content assessed? So this content could be assessed in either the section two or section three. So it could be assessed in terms of a short answer question. Short answer questions like those on our screen. So for example, from the 2016 paper, I draw from A, identify two contributions to Buddhism made by one significant person or school of thought other than the Buddha. We'll come back to these questions at the end, but it's good to have this end in mind. And then B, what impact has, one, what impact has Ashoka had on the expression of Buddhism? I want you to note here how the question specifically asks for expression. And we go back to our syllabus and it has development and expression. The contribution points that we'll discuss can certainly be interchanged, but it's also important that we have a point of difference between what are the contributions he's made to the development of the religion and what contributions he's made to the expression of the religion. We have here an example of an eight marker, like in the 2020 paper. To what extent has one significant person, so to what extent has Ashoka encouraged Buddhists to live the teachings of the Buddhists with an S? Okay, so again, we'll come back to this question at the very end of the seminar. The content can also be used in a specific essay like that in section three. Um, so we have here again from the 2020 HSC paper, um, an essay, a specific essay on Ashoka. So to what extent has one significant person or school of thought assisted adherence by showing them the path. And in this question, you'd have to define and articulate an understanding of the path. So if this was the question that you were choosing to do um, in the, as an essay, um, it would require, it would be a full essay on Ashoka. So the mark ranges between, so far, between two marks and 20 marks. And we have here an example of the 2021 HSC paper. So if you were seeing the paper last year, um, how does Buddhism guide adherents on their life's journey? And this question could be a holistic question or, 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 a, or a question that you can then choose what, area, what um, areas you want to use within the Buddhism course to help support your point. So you might refer to it a source of ethics or a practice, et cetera, but you certainly could mention um, or use Ashoka to support your point about, um, to support your points that you want to raise in a holistic response. Um, so that's the end in mind. We're, we're ranging between two and 20. Okay. So just to begin with, a bit of context of Ashoka. Uh, when I review these contexts, it's only really to make sense of the contributions themselves. Um, they usually will not feature in your responses. Okay, well, they shouldn't feature in your responses. There's not much marks connected to biography, if any at all. They could be used in an essay to help um, add details because the marking criteria does say detailed, relevant and accurate, but I certainly wouldn't expand on this um, further than at an identification level. So who we're talking about is a um, prince, excuse me, born in 304 BCE in Pataliputra, which was the capital of the Marian dynasty. Um, he wasn't the first in line to the throne, but through conquests, eventually became the emperor of the Marian dynasty. If we were to look at the most critical points of his, uh, the most critical awakening moment of his life came in the year 260 BCE, 
where he engaged in the Battle of Kalinga. The battle was a disaster. There were hundreds, 100,000 plus people dead as a result. Um, and this perhaps was the most, uh, an epiphany moment for um, the emperor at the time. Leading up to this moment, his nickname was even Chanda Shoka, which means Ashoka the Fierce, attributed to his um, fierceness and violence. In the middle of the battlefield, he says this, what have I done? If this is a victory, what's a defeat then? If this vict is this a victory or defeat? Is it valor to kill innocent children and women? Do I widen the empire and for prosperity? Sorry, do I do it to widen the empire and for prosperity or to destroy the other's kingdom and splendor? One has lost her husband, someone else a father, someone a child and someone an unborn infant. So for Ashoka, this is the, if you're thinking of the life of Paul of Tarsus being knocked off the horse as an epiphany moment, uh, this would be the equivalent for King Ashoka, where here he was really confronted with this question, what is it truly to mean to be victorious? An understanding of Buddhism shows us that true understanding about what it means to be victorious is the achievement of Nirvana itself. That is true victory in this sense. So even though he won the battle, he lost many things that day, and it led to a very slow conversion and adoption of Buddhism. It didn't happen overnight, but he realized that who he was in this battle couldn't, um, wasn't able, to, wasn't a sustainable way of living. There were a lot of influences around him. For example, his grandfather was a Jain, J-A-I-N. Jainism is another sub-religion within India, which focuses on absolute non-violence or pacifism. Later on, this absolute non-violence would influence Ashoka and his own peaceful interactions with his neighbors um, throughout uh, neighboring dynasties as well. His wife was a Buddhist and he had a great teacher, bhikkhu meaning monk, um, Upagutu of Mathura. Um, who taught him about Buddhist um, doctrines and tenets, etc. As a result, he did convert to Buddhism and became the first king in history to be a Buddhist. As king, it comes with a certain patronage of the religion um, and a certain spotlight to the religion that um, common lay people or ordinary monks cannot bring. As king, he's most remembered for promoting those central tenets of Buddhism, and he did that by issuing edicts built on, um, those edicts were generally carved out on, on uh, rock pillars, okay, um, and then distributed within and beyond the empire. He built stupas and established Buddhism as the state religion um, um, and establishing shrines and pilgrimage points, etc. He's known for his generosity or dana, and he built roads and hospitals and water transit. Now, all of this could be seen as simply an act of a good king, but rebuilding roads, for example, actually also helped to spread the Dharma or the teachings of Buddhism even further. For his contribution to the spread of the Dharma, Chandashoka became known as Dharma Shoka. And if we break that up, it's Ashoka of the Dharma or Ashoka of the Buddhist teachings. He says, the finest conquest is the conquest of what is right and not might. So we see here a really good contrast between this first quote, you know, if this is victory, what is defeat? But true victory is in doing what is right. What is right within Buddhism is that middle way, following the Eightfold Path and the ultimate victory of enlightenment itself. Um, so you see here just a little picture of Ashoka and then these rock pillars on the side uh, with his edicts being spread all throughout India and beyond in places like Afghanistan, even as far as Greece. So with this context, we now need to break down what were the contributions Ashoka made to the development and expression of the religion. When I think of development, I think of synonyms like grow or expand. So what did Ashoka do to grow or develop or, or expand the religion? 
But I think about expression. I think about the characteristics of religion. They are, according to the course, texts, beliefs, ethics, and practices. So what does the shoka do to enhance those aspects of the religion? What does it do to clarify beliefs or expand ethics or uh, contribute to texts, for example? I highlight a few points on either side. Now, why it's important to distinguish development from expression, as I mentioned earlier in that short answer example that we see here, which specifically asks for his contributions to expression, it's good to have in mind an articulated understanding that if it was expression, I'm talking about this. If it was development, I'm talking about this. However, they are actually interchangeable. If you're a clever writer, for example, um, again, you don't even have to talk about all of these points. You could talk about the points that your teacher has given you. Um, and you could talk about one of these points or all of these points, depending on the mark value associated with them. Um, the question that we should have in the background is what would, what would Buddhism look like without these contributions? What would Buddhism look like if Ashoka didn't sponsor the Sangha, which led to um, an influx of people becoming monks and nuns? As a result, though, it did lead to some heretical monks and nuns. So not long after sponsoring the Sangha, he would call the third council of Pataliputra in the capital city. That cap, the, that, so even this contribution of leading that Buddhist council was a pivotal point um, of his contribution to the development of, of religion. It had been uh, uh, over 100 years since the last council um, um, uh, in Vasali, 200 years earlier. Um, so it's been at least a couple of hundred years since the Buddha has died. The founder has died. And ultimately, this council, what it does is affirm the three jewels of Buddhism. It confirms rules for monks and nuns, which we call the Vinaya. It put together and finalized the Abhidharma Pitaka, uh, which is the third part of the Tripitaka, the third basket. Um, it helped to, it commissioned monks and nuns to spread the Dharma. I haven't used the word missionaries. Missionary activity is not really a Buddhist concept, but there were certainly monks and nuns charged with spreading the Dharma far and wide. And they had different levels of success. Um, really successful mission, for example, was to Sri Lanka, where almost the entire island became a Buddhist nation as a result, um, a Theravada Buddhism. Um, in terms of expression, I'm going to focus on his contribution to Buddhist practice. Ashoka never added to Buddhist belief. Okay, um, but what he did do was find ways to make obvious, to put into spotlight, which he could do because he was king, some of those practices of Buddhism or some of its core ethical teachings or giving those ethical teachings new meaning. In terms of sacred texts, as I mentioned, he compiled the Abhidhamma Pitaka, which is the commentary on the Sutta Pitaka. He gave witness to the principles of Ahimsa or nonviolence, and he put into public policy the ethical teachings of Buddhism. And I have a few listed there. Once we've got these contributions and we have an understanding of these contexts, um, these probably contributions are probably more useful when it comes to those short answer questions. But if we want those higher order marks, if we're going for an eight mark question or an essay, we really got to zoom into this second dot point. What would happen if Ashoka never did these things? What would be the and ultimately, what was the positive impact this, these contributions had on Buddhism as a whole? So what I have on the next few slides is I'm really divulging on impacts here. Okay, I'm really talking about impacts. So if we zoom out, I'm going to sort of break this up into three core ideas. Development, and I've got two sort of ideas for expression, ethics and sort of practice up here. So to recap those, the, his contributions to the development of the religion, we see his um, um, sponsoring of the Sangha, um, sponsoring the Third Buddhist Council, really leading that, um, endorsing Buddhism as the official state religion, and commissioning monks and nuns to spread the Dharma within and beyond the empire. Let's just take that last one for a moment. <clears throat> well, as a result of commissioning those monks and nuns, what happened was one group of monks and nuns went you know, south towards Southeast Asia 
And as a result, what developed was the Theravada school of thought. Another group of monks started going up towards the Silk Road, as far as even the, uh, you know, through Tibet and China, and eventually to Korea in a few hundred years' time. And then they crossed the ditch into Japan. This is over hundreds of years to develop the Mahayana school of thought. So if we think about if what is if if Ashoka didn't commission those monks and nuns, could Buddhism be like Hinduism in the sense that it's con confined to the geography of India? What we actually see is Buddhism grow and develop and actually thrive among different cultures as well. It speaks to the dynamic nature of Buddhism. So he allowed, he actually contributed to growing the religion and ensuring its success and viability um, and ability to um, um, conform with different cultures and continue to thrive and grow. That would be a really solid contribution to discuss in an eight marker, for instance. Um, also the third council, had a lot of emphasis on the Sangha. The capital S Sangha refers to monks and nuns, but it could also widely, it also could also refer to the wider Buddhist community. Um, in sponsoring the Sangha and then removing the heretical monks and nuns, what he's done is he's strengthened the Sangha at the time. Okay. Um, what I've done is I've put a little evaluation note there. By writing at the time, I'm sort of limiting the extent of his contribution. Certainly those um, orthodox and unorthodox statement that was composed in the Third Buddhist Council continues to give meaning to monks and nuns today, but it generally has a limited effect on the general adherents today who adhere to Buddhism. Um, what it did do at the time was give enough people um, interpreting and protecting the Tripitaka to ensure Buddhism's longevity um, and ensuring a clear and universal understanding of the Vinaya, the rules for monks and nuns. Now, we think about the Sangha as the third jewel of Buddhism. Therefore, it's among the three most important concepts of Buddhism. We can see this as a pretty important impact as well. As we respond, particularly in those eight markers and essays, it's really important we use relevant quotes. Those quotes, if we're sourcing them directly from Ashoka, we can use quotes from the edicts or the rock pillars directly themselves. They're quite accessible online. For instance, Ashoka says, everywhere in my domain, the Sangha will go on inspection tours every five years for the purpose of Dharma instruction. So from this quote, we can see the priority Ashoka made to spread the Dharma, and we could link that to the impacts he made, um, so we can link that to the contribution of commissioning monks and nuns and the impacts of helping Buddhism thrive and adapt in different cultures throughout the world. So it's really important that we integrate some Ashoka quotes themselves, and I'll go through a couple here as we go as well. The second um, so, sort of contribution category that I've sort of done here is really around practice. So um, really, really crucially, um, Ashoka, um, I guess at the time, Buddhism, and it still is today, Buddhism can certainly be seen as an individualistic religion. You know, there's a big focus on individual puja, for example. So Buddhism didn't really have the structures um, um, around um, for communal gatherings, etc. So, um, really cr critically, Ashoka built, spread, and maintained the Dharma and Buddhist practices um, like puja or visiting shrines or temples. What I have here on the screen is an example of a stupa. Throughout his kingdom, Ashoka built 84,000 of these, um, one to represent each of the sutras or verses of the Buddha. So if we think about its overall impact, particularly at the time, it gave a very visible uh, promotion of the Dharma. It helped to create a sense of unity. It helped to create a sense of public gathering places. It allowed Buddhism to not only be an individualistic philosophy or way of life, but truly a communal religion as well. Similarly, he established pilgrimage sites, the four main pilgrimage sites connected to the life of the Buddha. For example, the Bini, where the Buddha was born, and Bodhgaya, the site of his enlightenment. Um, on this, 
um, we can look at the interaction there between principal beliefs and practices, therefore showing a truly a living religion, a contrib contribution to Buddhism as a living religion as a whole. Um, to create this visibility, as a result, another impact would be to help to standardize teachings and interpretations, strengthening Buddhist unity, even beyond the empire, and ultimately preserve sacred texts, the commentary, which is the Abhidharma Pitaka. The edict I draw from here is the third edict of the third major edict. These Dharma texts I desire that all monks and nuns may constantly listen to and remember, likewise laymen and women. From this quote, to use cause and effect language, this suggests that the Dharma is um, important to the lives of all the Sangha, um, which includes the monks and nuns and lay people, um, as a way of life, um, not only to listen to and remember, but to live out and practice as well for the pursuit of truest victory, which is enlightenment itself. Um, 11th edict. This is the inscription of the Dharma has been made so that the sons of the kingdom, of this kingdom, should know that victory lies in them, not in conquest. Delight in the Dharma in this world and in the next. This is a very powerful edict quote. Um, the inscription is um, really highlighting that um, uh, the power from within um, to achieve enlightenment. The world is about conquering your own um, um, conquering your own desire, conquering your own selfishness, conquering your own ego, conquering your own ignorance, or to break that cycle of samsara, which is the truest conquest of this world. We were delighted in this world and the next. It's not referring to an afterlife per se, per se but the ultimate goal of Nirvana. Um, just to highlight the spread of the Dharma further, Ashoka really made this a um, accessible dharma for everybody. The rock edicts themselves, they don't, they don't only use words, they use pictures and poems and um, images um, that all people, whether they could read or not, could actually start to understand aspects of the dharma. Um, as the king, he would then have people read out that dharma um, to proclaim it in public areas as well. Um, to help celebrate um, the Dharma itself and spread it. So we can really also talk about the impact of making the religion accessible to the people of his time. Um, again, there's a layer of evaluation there. Okay, the third area, general area of, uh, I've put in is his contribution to ethics. As I mentioned earlier, Ashoka never actually contributed anything new to beliefs, okay? What he did do, as I just discussed, is the expression of practices, you know, uh, pilgrimage, for example, and here uh, confirming or making public Buddhist precepts and ethical way of living. Um, particularly the moral principle of Ahimsa, which is the principle of nonviolence. Ahimsa is um, not only a lofty or philosophy, et cetera, but it also has implications on the everyday way of life for adherence, to live peacefully with others, um, um, to, this is sort of the Jain influence as well, um, to almost have a, path, a pacifist lifestyle. Uh, Shoka's edicts really concerned ethics from a broad, broad range of um, topics. Ecological sustainability, for example, um, he would prevent, um, uh, he would create reserves for protecting the natural environment. He would ban um, the hunting of um, endangered species or um, of beautiful animals, etc. He would encourage vegetarianism um, for certainly for him and for his court. He didn't make that, that a law per se, but certainly if the king's doing it, it has a certain level of influence. Um, family harmony by respecting your parents, for example. Um, religious freedom. Um, Ashoka would say that um, a real the the only downfall of a religion was really um, influencing or, or trying to convert. So it, the focus wasn't necessarily on conversion, but true tolerance um, of people of other religions as well, um, and real tolerance of them. Um, so the impacts of this, the impact of writing these ethical precepts on the rock pillars that spread right across the empire was that it clarified the moral precepts of Buddhism. 
When I read this, I also see a new interpretation of that first moral precept, which is to refrain from harming sentient beings, which Buddhism extends to the animal life as well. So by encouraging vegetarianism or respecting animals or preventing hunting and poaching and um, um, uh, the vegetarian lifestyle of his court, it's given an extension to the moral precept, extending that precept to include a peaceful coexistence with the animal life and with the environment as well, which leads to positive or skillful karma, again, with that end goal, the end victory of Nirvana itself. Um, this was a benchmark way of life that he tried to create for his empire with varying degrees of success. One particularly interesting point, if we understand a little bit about the culture he was in, there was still quite prevalent um, the caste system. Um, probably don't have too much time to dive into the caste system per se, uh, but the caste system essentially segregated people into four key castes. But Ashoka's laws around uh, respecting others, social justice, caring for the poor, et cetera, certainly challenged the caste system um, so that it could extend beyond the caste that you're in to respect all people. In general, we call all of Ashoka's rules of ethics the law of piety. And even though the law of piety itself has passed into history, and we really have focus on the five moral precepts, for example, they certainly help to paint the picture of what those precepts are all about. Um, we could even go as far as to say that his example of Ahimsa, um, dealing peacefully with his neighboring countries, would have certainly influenced um, um, Buddhist leaders today. Take, for example, if you fast forward um, a couple thousand years to the Dalai Lama and his ongoing fight for the peaceful liberation of Tibet, could look uh, almost has a similar storyline to Ashoka, uh, where through the principles of Ahimsa and non violence, seeks to make public, lead publicly through the moral precepts. Um, you know, so the Dalai Lama didn't fight back, for example, it led him to receive a Nobel Peace Prize. Um, likewise, Ashoka, after the Battle of Kalinga, have had a real, real peaceful, um, treaty-based relationship with his neighboring kingdoms as well. The second edict says that the practice of the Dharma consists of having little evil and practicing kindness, generosity, truthfulness, purity, gentleness, goodness, increase among the people. So from this, we see a real ethical lifestyle. Um, so I'm sort of using this quote, if we could draw from this, um, the law of piety itself. Um, so being kind and generous, for example, um, which um, again supports a Buddhist way of life and the precepts. Or the 11th edict, there is no gift like the gift of the Dharma, which consists of proper behavior which we can interpret as adherence to this law of piety. Here in my domain, no animals will be slaughtered or offered in sacrifice. Again, supporting a ex extension of the first moral precept. If I was to summarize Ashoka, I will do so like this, that Ashoka created an infrastructure. And I use that word because he also, like I said earlier, the water transit, and major roads and hospitals and um, schools to teach the Dharma. Um, so I'm sort of using this word here metaphysically that a stoker could also create an infrastructure of goodness for his empire through the spreading of the Dharma and the law of piety and through a reformation of the Sangha through particularly the third council of Buddhism in Pataliputra. This was his lasting legacy is a reminder that the purest victory is not conquest in an external sense, but conquest of suffering, conquest of ignorance, uh, which would lead to a true victory, which is the attainment of Nirvana itself. So that sort of concludes that area of, of content. It would be a miss though, if we don't spend a little bit of time um, diving into um, some responses, okay, which we brought up earlier in the presentation as well. So if we go back to this um, section two, two marker, for example, to identify two contributions made by Ashoka, will do so as follows that uh, I've got a bit of a sample response. All the marker is looking for is really to identify two contributions. So I have here a sample, which I've drawn from different students. Um, Ashoka sponsored and called the third council of Pataliputra, which helped to remove heretical monks, that's one. Secondly, he promoted the Buddhist way of living through his law of piety communicated through edicts, that's two. Okay, so that would be my example of how I'd get two marks there. 
The second part of the question, now what impact has he had on expression? Now, because I've started to separate his contributions into development and expression, my mind automatically goes to those points that we raised regarding his expression. So his contribution to practices and his contribution to ethics themselves. Um, I've got a bit of a sample response again. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to use the, the chat as well. A um, bit of a sample response. Apologies, just closing that. Ashoka's contribution to the promulgation of the Dharma made the teachings of the Buddha accessible to the rich and poor equally. Ashoka highlighted interactions of these, of these beliefs with practice, consequently impacting the expression of Buddhism. So you see there the, the characteristics of religion. This significantly impacted Buddhism at the time. Again, we have the scope of evaluation, as this interaction creates for adherence a sense of belonging and meaning. This is highlighted by the promotion of pilgrimage sites such as Lamidi, the Buddha's birthplace. The rock pillars which the Dharma was engraved on helped to standardize an understanding of the Dharma. The impact was recognized, and we're using words from the question there, that's really affirmed was recognized well beyond the Mariah dynasty with pillars supporting the Dharma in places as far as Greece and Afghanistan. Ashoka contributed to the expression of Buddhist ethics, extending the first precept through the practice of uh, promoting vegetarianism, protecting endangered species, and letting Ahimsa inform his political policies. This, impact, this impacts adherence today by highlighting the precepts, how the precepts can form a way of living and challenging them to respect all people. Um, so what makes this a five out of five? Excuse me. We have there an articulation of the contributions. So we see there that the, um, the Dharma has been spread through the rock pillars or a promotion of um, pilgrimage sites. But the focus is not on the contributions. The focus is actually on the impacts. It's as a result of these things, these things have happened. Um, without which, Buddhism would be impacted like this. Okay. Um, what else we can affirm about this response is that it refers to adherence today. We're not just talking about a 2,300-year-old um, figure, um, but rather relaying the impacts today to highlight that for, uh, that would help to strengthen the response as well. Okay. Going to our essay. To what extent has one significant person or school of thought other than the Buddha assisted adherence by showing them the path? So to what extent has Ashoka assisted adherence by showing them the path? Here we can interpret the path as um, the Dharma itself, for example. Um, and then that would have, if we were to reword that, to what extent has Ashoka showed adherence to Dharma. Uh, and th that would have a really, really strong response there too. And uh, we could easily start to make sense of um, breaking down his contributions. I sort of broke down those contributions to three main areas. The contribution to the development, strengthening the Sangha, um, the Council of Pasalaputra, the contribution to practices, the Abhidhamma Pataka, etc. And the third contribution, which was um, towards ethics and law of piety, etc. We could almost use those as a bedrock of three sort of general paragraphs to help respond to this. Um, really to highlight here um, would be a um, making sure that we're not only talking about the impacts, but we see here an extent question. So to evaluate those impacts. Now Ashoka, for many respects, some of his things have died and died with him. Um, for example, his uh, law of piety, which was for some was seen as um, uh, so lofty and philosophical um, that it wasn't really practiced by the everyday lay people, but it had a really high impact among his local court as the king himself had a really high impact of his court, for example. So that's an example of evaluation or, you know, uh, impact of uh, on the Sangha of his time is also showing the extent. We're limiting the extent to his time. But overall, we want to keep that contribution um, positive. Uh, we've had a, ultimately a positive contribution to the religion as a whole. Um, likewise, the holistic essay, uh, we could use a paragraph, and I've sort of taken this from another student as well. Um, 
apologies for the speed of rushing through this, but feel free to, again, if you would like me to go back and highlight anything slower, I'm happy to do so. But we see here an example of a, of a general paragraph that we could use in our response and I'll um, indulge myself and we'll read it together. Ashoka's patronage of Buddhism as king of the Mariah dynasty ensured Buddhism's growth and longevity. So from this, the marker knows what we're talking about here is the contribution of patronage to Buddhism um, and the ultimate the impact there would be growth and longevity. This paragraph isn't necessarily directed to that question previously. Otherwise, you'd want to highlight showing them the path, uh, making sure that's in integrated here as well. In adopting Buddhism, so again, this is an example of how context can help flavor a response, but it shouldn't be the focus. He made it the official state religion, giving attention to its precepts and support to its Sangha. For instance, one of his major contributions was calling the Third Council of Buddhism in 250 BCE in Pataliputra. The council helped to expel deceptive monks and establish orthodoxy among the Sangha, strengthening the Third Jewel of Buddhism to a significant extent at his time. What we see there is an example of that evaluation. Through his edicts, he also encouraged lay adherents to adopt similar standards. I desire all monks and nuns constantly listen and remember the Dharma and likewise lay people. Um, this also helped to make the Dharma more visible, showing its capacity to inform public policy at the time while ensuring its longevity today. Further, the second point, the council also commissioned missionaries um, which allow the Dharma to spread throughout the dynasty. The impact of these contributions can, can be uh, were seen immediately with entire countries such as Sri Lanka becoming Buddhist nations. As a result of missionary activity, Theravada Buddhism became a unique expression of Southeast Asia. Meanwhile, Mahayana Buddhism developed along the Silk Road. Um, Mukhi states, Ashoka's memory is kept alive when you see the spread of Buddhism throughout India and beyond. This contribution allowed for a diversity to develop within Buddhism, and still to this day, um, it demonstrates Buddhism's ability to adapt to different cultures, illustrating its viability as a living religion. Ashoka's contribution to the growth of Buddhism or to the development of Buddhism remains evident in the expression of Buddhism's universal and adaptable nature today. So it'll be an example there of a, of a paragraph that we could use um, um, what we need to do if we're using it for this question is making sure we link the path and the stimulus as well. So that's King Ashoka. So I might um, stop sharing there and I'll um, just see if there's any questions in the chat. Not quite. Okay, so I thank you very much for um, for joining me this afternoon. I might um, throw over to, to um, Andy. Well, thanks very much, Anthony. That was extremely enjoyable and helpful. And just to let everyone know that the uh, recording of this video and a copy of that presentation will be shared on our mission and identity site. The uh, location of that site is on the first slide of the presentation. And some of those sample answers which you've given us uh, are going to come in really useful. Much appreciated. And uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone.